I'm the project coordinator for the Black Rhino Range Expansion Project, BREP for short, and part of my job is to look at the genetics of some of our um, 12, soon to be 13, black rhino populations that have been established over the years. And um, I was very fortunate last year to be presenting here as well, um, giving quite in-depth results of what we found in terms of genetically um, analyzing these populations. And since we've been able to learn lessons from these results, and so now we're moving on to actually looking at management strategies. Um, so that's kind of where, where I'm gonna be going today. Um, so yeah, what we're gonna, gonna discuss today, um, since I only have 12 minutes and we could probably be spending days um, discussing metapopulation management in black rhino genetics, um, is looking at um, management of existing BREP populations, both on an individual population level and on a metapopulation level. So how can we manage, genetically manage, all of our BREP sites combined as a you know, quote-unquote metapopulation? And then also looking at understanding genetic diversity in KwaZulu-Natal specifically and beyond. Very quick background, um, some, of it some of it has already been touched on. Um, in KwaZulu-Natal, the DB miner went through a severe bottleneck in the 1930s. Only about 110 animals remained between Mkuzi and Tehuliam Falozi reserves. Um, so that um, has severely decreased the uh, amount of genetic diversity found in the remaining animals. Um, very nicely seen in the number of haplotypes remaining in KZN animals versus the Zimbabwean subgroup that still have up to six haplotypes available. Um, South African national average heterozygosity score for DB minor is only a 0.394. A, any animal species that has not gone through a bottleneck um, should be sitting at 0.6 to 0.8. So that gives you a bit of an idea of where we're standing in terms of a decrease in genetic diversity. So because we are dealing with this, um, we need to have a look at having good genetic management of these populations to prevent any de further decreases in genetic diversity and to make sure we are not going into inbreeding depression um, with it. Um, very quick background on Black Rhino Range Expansion Project. Um, the first population was established in 2004 and subsequently 11 more, um, about to be 12. The rhinos that we translocate into new areas to establish new populations come from source, um, sources in Ezenvelo parks as well as Eastern Cape parks. And in 2017 was the first time that BREP offspring that has been born and brought up on BREP sites were actually used to establish a new population. So the project came full circle in that sense and we've done it again this year. And we're also starting to see second generation offspring on some of our older BREP sites. And what this means is that we're starting to deal with numbers and with a number of animals and generations where we need to consider genetic management because these animals are all in fenced areas and they're not able to migrate. Um, so two of the most critical questions that we need to ask ourselves in these populations is how do individuals and especially offspring relate to each other and how genetically diverse are these populations? And in order to answer these questions, um, we look at paternity of offspring and the overall heterozygosity levels, so the genetic diversity levels of these populations. And then relatedness of individuals ties back to both of the points above. Um, and that's the details I presented on last year, so I'm just gonna quickly touch on a few things and then um, carry on into um, how, to, how we're going to be managing or population management from a genetic point of view. So population diversity, um, you see some of our BREP sites listed here. Um, you can see that the, the mean expected heterozygosity levels sit with most of our BREP sites at about the national and the provincial average. There are a couple of sites which have quite a, a higher genetic diversity, and that may be due to the combination of animals that were translocated from the different sources. The numbers in brackets are the number of rhinos that were used to calculate the, um, the that expected heterozygosity score. What we've done then is having a look at the effective score. So the effective score is the number of animals that are actually actively contributing genetics to the population. So those are breeding females and dominant bulls. And you can see that with the effective population, only about 35 to 50% of the animals in the population are actually effective animals in the sense that they are contributing genetic material um, and, um, and producing offspring. Um, and so that's a very important point to make. So you can have a, a population that's sitting at 20 or 30 animals, but you actually only have 10 or 15 animals that are genetically contributing um, to the future. And we need to keep that in mind as we, as we manage these populations. Then in terms of paternity, this is one of our um, older BREP sites. You can see in the left-hand column, a rhino ID, those are all the offspring. Uh, they are listed in chronological order of their date of birth. And um, I'm going to attempt to use this. 
Uh, you can see that we will always um, confirm maternity um, when, it, when we do the um, genetic analysis and then confirmed paternity. You can see that in this um, population there are two dominant bulls, 72 and 300, and there's most likely a third one. You see it says not found. The reason for that is that we've got three bulls that were deceased and that we were unfortunately not able to source um, a DNA pro, um, sample for. Um, so we're unsure of who fathered these, but you can see by process of elimination of the date of death of the three unknown um, bulls that um, most likely 146 may have fathered at least the last three, um, the last three calves. The other thing that you'll see as well, and keep this in mind as we start talking about management, is that you'll see that the bulls will associate with the same female. So the 72, he breeds repeatedly with 174, uh, 147, and with number 7, and then you see um, 300, he um, repeatedly breeds with 246. So there seem to be some sort of associations between the males and the females, whether it's the bulls selecting the females or the other way around, we don't know, but um, keep that in mind as we go along. Um, so from these results, um, we were able to, or starting to start, uh, have a look at genetic management. So we now have data that we can use to manage these populations. So what we've done is creating a, ge um, a genetic management plan for the BREP sites with the idea that we have a generic plan that can be used by all of the sites. And then we have a look at each individual site's paternity and heterozygosity scores. And we do um, short to medium term um, interventions that then um, accompany that general genetic management plan. Some of the key management recommendations that have come out of this is that obviously we need to monitor relatedness and try and reduce and prevent inbreeding where possible. Um, and one way of doing that is to manage the dominant bulls um, and basically swap them out or remove them of each generation. So tenure will be about eight to 10 years. And this is just to prevent the bulls from mating with their, uh, their offspring. And then the same goes for managing offspring. It's easiest usually to manage the males. Um, again, you don't want them to end up uh, mating with um, siblings or with their moms. Um, and that, again, here, you're talking more about removals. So the issue is also with the rhinos, uh, black rhinos temperament. It's quite easy to remove animals and have gene outflow out of a population. It's much more difficult to get gene inflow because these guys like to, they're not very fond of strangers and, and uh, new guys coming into population. And um, yeah, they, they often like to fight and sometimes even kill each other. So what we need to consider though is gene flow into the population. It's very important. Rule of thumb is that one migrant per generation, so in the case of black rhinos, it'll be about every eight years, is enough to keep the heterozygosity level at whatever level the population is at that time. However, it has to be effective gene flow. So if you're introducing a subadult male into a population that's not going to breed for another 10 years, that's not an effective gene flow. So you would see your, potentially see your heterozygosity levels in the population going down. But if you have a female that's going to breed or a dominant bull that's being brought in, then um, you're, yeah, you're on the right track. Um, so from there, what we need to do is, even though we've just talked about managing individual populations, we need to start having a look at the bigger picture as well and, and looking at managing populations not only as single units but together. And we can do this in the case of KZN and with BREP by looking at the genetic makeup of BREP sites and of Azenvelo populations and that will allow us to swap animals out if we need to. Um, and also it gives us a good idea of when we establish new populations of which animals we're going to be taking out of these Azenvelo populations. So in terms of selecting rhinos for supplementing existing populations, um, one thing that we can do is let's say we've got, uh, we've got Frick at, at Wienen and he's got a bull that needs to go. He's been running around and mating for 10 years and we've got somebody at one of the BREP sites, they've got the same thing with a bull. What we can do if all of the animals are DNA profiled is we can simply take those two DNA profiles and, um, and we, can, we can basically um, swap these animals out. But before we do that, we do it as a desktop um, uh, exercise in the sense that we can just by having all these populations genetically profiled, we can have a look, okay, if we stick this bull into that population, um, is there gonna be from a genetic diversity point of view, does it make sense? Is that bull genetically different enough from the previous dominant bull to actually um, provide good effective gene flow into the population? Um, and then the second thing that we're looking at as well is establishing new populations and using um, DNA profiling for that. So basically what we can do is if we have all of the populations DNA profiled and, and have that done with Azenvelo populations as well, is that we can 
projects what's going to happen. First of all, in terms of removals. So when we do removal strategies, you obviously have to look at sex ratios and age structures and things like that of the animal uh, and, and removing animals that are appropriate for that. But now you can also start having a look at which animals do you want to be have removed in terms of a, from a genetic point of view. Um, perhaps some animals that are really quite highly related to other ones, you can remove. And at the same time, if um, all of the animals are genetic, uh, are DNA profiled that you're going to remove once you've earmarked those, you can actually predict the heterozygosity of the new population before you've even captured an animal, let alone translocated it. And the key here is balance. And somebody mentioned it earlier, is that you don't want to remove all of the good genetic individuals from a source population and leave the source population with, with you know, sort of genetically inferior animals. Um, but you also don't want to um, you know, go the other way around as well, where you're gonna end up removing animals, which if you add them all together into a new population are not gonna give you a good head start in terms of um, a, uh, average hetero or good heterozygosity of a new population. So that's where the balance comes in. Um, and up until recently, we have not been able to do this in that we were, we've had all of the rhinos that we were going to be moving profiled so that we can actually predict heterozygosity before we even move the rhinos up until a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this is actually quite exciting. Um, we are currently in the process of translocating some KZN DB miners into a poppy or into a, a location where there are some Kruger DB miners already present. And both of those populations have been completely DNA profiled. And so what this has allowed us to do is to predict what the heterozygosity scores or what the heterozygosity of the new population is going to be before even having moved animals, which is um, quite quite interesting. So you can see this is the, the BREP population that's going to be moving from KZN. This is the existing population. Um, these are Kruger-based animals. Um, so they have a, um, a partially um, Zimbabwean and partially KZN genes from back in the day when Kruger was repopulated. And um, so you can look at the, at the expected heterozygosity score. It's sitting very much on a KZN provincial average of 0.399. And it's a little bit higher for um, these animals, these Kruger animals right here. And this is gonna be your combined score. So this is gonna be the heteros average heterozygosity of this population once these animals have been moved together. Interestingly enough, looking at um, inbreeding coefficient, even though we have to be careful with this because here we're only dealing with a single generation of animals, is that the inbreeding coefficient here is a little bit higher, um, and that's because it's a smaller population that has not seen any gene inflow. So you'll see once those KZN animals have come in, even though from a heterozygosity point of view, they're sitting lower than um, these animals already in the site, the inbreeding coefficient will actually drop because you're bringing in new genes. So that's exactly what we're talking about with, with potential effective gene flow. Again, this is quite theoretical at this stage because we don't know who's gonna be breeding with who, but it just gives you a bit of an idea of, of what's going to happen. Um, I just put in the table here at the bottom, this is a relatedness matrix of having used the animals from both populations. And it's just, it's, it's quite an amazing thing. You know, you can, you, we are now able to have a relatedness matrix of rhinos which are not actually physically in the same space yet. Um, so it's, it's quite exciting work. And um, yeah, hopefully we can take it further in the future. And so just as a conclusion, um, genetics has become and isn't a very important tool in population management, um, but it's also not the only tool. And I think it's very important is that people don't take genetics as gospel, but it can be an important tool to make pragmatic decisions, management decisions about um, how, to, how to go about managing black rhino populations. And also being able to use DNA analysis as a predictive tool of genetic diversity and when we start putting together new populations. Um, so the big take home message of this really is that we can and should be using targeted genetic management to ensure that we've got healthy and sustainable black rhino populations above and beyond just growing numbers. Cheers.